There we go. That'll work for now. Let's get this underway and you can follow with it later. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order and recognize that we are meeting on the traditional territories of the Apechalit and Chichat First Nations, so that we celebrate and appreciate that. And, uh, and I'd like to advise that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed to you on YouTube and on the uh, regional district website. The introductions of the committee members and staff present in the room. We usually do that. Yes, Mr. Chair, just it's hard for the people on Zoom to see who's actually sitting at the board table. So we just have your introductions around the table. All right. Introduce yourself, please. Wendy Thompson, General Manager of Administrative Services. George, introduce yourself. George Rose, Manager of Information Technology, Learning Lake Lot Region District. I'm John McNabb, Regional District Director for Beaver Creek. I'm uh, Daniel Sayon, I'm the CAO for the Alberta and Clive Regional District. I'm Mike Erg, I'm the General Manager of Planning and Development. Go ahead. We'll call Duncan, Duncan Booth, I'm the Alberta Valley Wild State BC Community Coordinator. Awesome. So we'd like an approval for the, of the agenda, unless there's any additions to it, which I haven't seen any. No, Mr. Chair, I'm not aware of any additions for the agenda today. Okay, move to approve the agenda. Somebody? Tanya and Ron. And all in favor? Look at that, majority. Okay, we got the minutes of the Alberta Valley and Banfield Service Committee meeting held September 1st, 2021. Somebody move the minutes or someone? So moved. Cote and Dr. Bodner. Is there any arrows or missions in there? Stuff you didn't say? Want to take back before it goes into print? No? Okay, all in favor? Carried. Petitions. Duncan. The Wild Safe, B B Wildlife, Wild Safe BC Alberni Valley Community Coordinator uh, end of season presentation on Wild Safe program in the Alberni Valley. There you go. Okay, great. And George will just give you a little wait for advancing the slides. No, I can. You, you, you could just do it yourself. Oh, I can do it here. Okay, great. Yeah, that. No problem. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so um, my name is Duncan Booth. I'm the Alberni Valley Community Coordinator for Wild Safe BC. And um, I will. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so just to confirm, because it didn't change on here. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I need to, okay. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. I need to see what slide George is working with here. Why can't we? 
I think this one is just displaying here, but it's not it's not actually yeah, representing what's on the screen. Up on the screen, mm -hmm. but you need to see the read, right? Mm -hmm. But so when if I change here, it doesn't change. Over no, there. yeah. 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 Okay. Say next. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm on slide two. Yeah. Okay, that's where I'm. Okay, so we can advance one slide, please. So Wild Safe BC is a program put on by the BC Conservation Foundation. Uh, we have a number of other initiatives along with Wild Safe BC, including uh, the Wildlife Collision Prevention Program, uh, including the um, uh, Land Procurement Program, Land for Animals, and the Fisheries Project in Space of Nanaimo. And Wild Safe began in 1998 as part of the um, Bearware Program, which began in Revelstoke. And, uh, Fast forward a number of years to 2013, the program expanded to include uh, lots of different types of wildlife that people run into conflict with. And since then, it has grown to become the uh, provincial leader in preventing conflict with wildlife. Uh, pardon me, you can go ahead uh, again, George. And then again, once more, please. Yep. So this map here represents all the reports that were made between May, uh, pardon me, April 1st and November, uh, the end of uh, October. Um, all in this year, we've had 172 black bear reports, which is uh, a little bit lower than the previous three-year average of 227. 74 cougar reports, which was uh, the highest on our records, and uh, closest you're coming, uh, or coming close to that was 2016 when we had 71. And uh, 84 deer reports. Garbage is our most significant, our most commonly reported uh, attractant, which is pretty well consistent across the board in the province. And fruit trees are our second most reported attractant. So bears that learn to forage on unnatural food sorts of sources like these, they often get locked into um, undesirable patterns of behavior where they're accessing food repeatedly. And it often leads to intervention from the conservation service, which uh, unfortunately leads to their destruction. Um, and so um, as they approach this time of year or just uh, shortly ago, they're consuming 20,000 calories a day. It's something called hyperphagia as they pre prepare for winter denning. So fruit trees are a large, a very, very significant attraction for them. And it also, that draws them into people's yards, which then kind of um, leaves other unsecured attractants uh, at their mercy. All this data is available in the annual report, which will be available on the WildSafe website soon. So now in 2021, Wild Safe BC has uh, 30 community programs running across the province. Um, each one has a coordinator, and uh, we perform a variety of different uh, education collaboration initiatives in each community. And I'll go through one of those these different initiatives one by one and just let you know what the program is able to accomplish. Please uh, advance one, George. So the Wild Safe Ranger program introduces young people to the uh, concepts of human wildlife conflict and also to attractant management and some wilderness safety and awareness. And this year we um, made five, over 550 students wild safe rangers at Wood Elementary, uh, Hyopia Act, EJ Dunn, McQuinna, John Howitt, and the Alberta District Secondary School. Um, Booths and display booths at community events. Uh, over 250 people were uh, connected with over six events, including uh, local farm, farmers markets and craft markets, the fall fair, and I was able to set up at a couple local trailheads and catch people going out onto the trail on a couple occasions as well. Uh, multiple uh, wilderness safety and awareness and bear spray workshops this year, uh, including to the Guru Nanak Sikh Society, uh, workers from the Shelter Society, and uh, North Island College uh, Market Gardening Program for the Rotary Club. We also held uh, an electric fence workshop and uh, gave uh, support for design and installation on electric fence ins installations in the area uh, and promoted the cost share program. We had one person go through the cost share program, but we uh, really laid the foundation for it and generated a lot of interest. And I think next year going forward, there'll be a really uh, invigorated interest in it. So door-to-door -door canvassing, this typically would follow uh, instances of acute conflict or um, reports in a certain area. And this year, I had almost 300 face-to-face -face conversations with people just by knocking on doors. 
and they left over 400 door hangers, which uh, contain our messaging as well as uh, invite people to contact me regarding the conflict that I was there for. Uh, garbage bin tagging. So this is where we place a high visibility sticker on uh, garbage bins that were placed out early uh, or otherwise uh, not in compliance with bylaw. And uh, I did eight surveys this year. Uh, 170 bins were tagged with only 11 bins requiring more than one sticker. It's a very, very high success rate, about 90%. And it's a very valuable program um, because garbage is our, is our most significant attractant. Uh, and especially as we have now, organic spins and garbage bins out, I think going forward, this will be a very, very valuable program. Uh, the Wild Safe BC Business Pledge allows businesses to demonstrate their commitment to community safety and reducing human wildlife conflict by um, taking the pledge, vowing to manage attractants around the business and, and help us spread our messaging for businesses in the area signed this year and uh, establish much interest among um, a number of other businesses to, to approach next season when the program starts up again. Our Facebook page is our main social media presence for the program in the community. Uh, this year we grew from 117 followers to uh, well over 400. Uh, this was done over 50 posts, which alerted the community to wildlife issues and situations, and as, as well as some of the other services we offer. Um, Wild safety supports communities in attaining their bear smart status and, and keeping it and maintaining it as well. And this year I uh, worked pretty closely with uh, the city of Port Alberni on a, on a few things um, around the bear smart designation. And I'll go over those in a little bit more detail on the next slide, which is uh, challenges and opportunities. So uh, most of these challenges uh, go part and parcel with bear smart community status commitments. Um, and uh, Port Alberni is up for their audit for the bear smart designation in 2023. And these are some of the kind of the most poignant things that came up. And the intention here is for communities to maintain their commitment to being bear smart by uh, looking at changes in development through a, a lens of bear human conflict reduction and, um, and adapting changes that influence conflict, uh, such as uh, urban sprawl and development, um, also uh, availability of new bear resistant infrastructure, uh, CSA approved electric fencing and uh, you know, municipal bins and that kind of thing. Uh, increasing food sustainability and tree cover is done in a manner with that uh, it reduces conflict or aims to reduce conflict. And uh, climate change is another thing that's impacting uh, the, the kind of interface lands around the city and could potentially you know, uh, create areas of, of a wildlife sink where animals come in because we're unintentionally creating habitats that are desirable. Um, the city uh, took an interest this year in creating their own um, endogenously designed uh, retrofit for municipal bins uh, to make them bear resistant, but also to juggle a number of priorities, including uh, disabled access and uh, to, to um, mitigate household dumping as well. So um, the, bear, the bins were not exactly resistant before, but uh, they were modified in a way that uh, sort of put their bear smart commitments into question, I suppose. Uh, the city is aware of this. We've, we've had conversations now um, and uh, it looks like everything is moving in the right direction, but it is a situation that I think going forward should be monitored and we could have um, Wild Safe BC and the Bear Smart uh, team in the, in the mix and in these conversations as, uh, as these things go forward. Uh, like I said, the city is aware of these issues. They've, they have taken the initiative to uh, increase education and awareness. And, um, and, and really uh, puts more energy into their bear smart commitments again. Um, uh, for me, I think a boon to the community would be a, some sort of bear working group with representation from the city and the district, conservation uh, and, and others, Wild Safe BC as well, of course, uh, to kind of help unify the messaging, uh, help kind of glue everything together a little bit. And uh, the Alberni Valley Gleaning Project is a really vital project here because fruit trees are such a significant attractant. The, pro the project dissolved very early this year before the brunt of the bear activity because of lack of uh, volunteers and uh, uh, some, some management in, in turbulence. But um, it, like I said, it really is a vital program. And I think finding collaboration support opportunities for the cleaning project can have a really big impact on the, on the community and reducing human wildlife conflict. Uh, 
the same with the electric fence cost share program. Uh, it was access only by one person this year, but um, we did lay the foundation for it. I think there's, this is a program that can really, really do, uh, reduce instances of acute conflict um, and uh, more promotion, uh, more supporting education will definitely grow. And also, Wild CPC messaging can go on Port Alberni's website uh, on their uh, Bear Smart page and their wildlife page. And the ACRD also has a Bear Smart page on the website, which could use some Wild CPC branding and messaging to kind of help unify uh, everything in the region. So, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the Alberta Clackwood Regional District, uh, especially Jenny Brunn, Jody Frank, Brenda Salve. Paulo Eichelberger and uh, the admin staff for all the support through the season this year. Also the province of British Columbia and the BC Conservation Foundation for enabling me to do this important work in the Valley. So, thanks. So uh, just everybody is probably just clawing to get out remarks here. Uh, so one thing I was gonna ask is we have a on between Beaver Creek and Gordon, uh, there's a resident there that's been there forever. Mm -hmm. um, really not problematic, but he does come around you know, and the fruit trees are just about finished and clean them off and mind his own business. I'm just kind of wondering how habitual their return to things like that. I mean, if you take the fruit away completely, is he going to be coming that route and then thinking, there's got to be something here that I don't um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a risk uh, in doing that because depending on the, the context, if you remove that thing that they're so used to, they, yeah, they might come back and, and immediately start looking for food in the vicinity, which can lead to further conflict, especially if there are unsecured attractants around other unsecured attractants. Yeah, this one has never been any problem other than, you know, he just comes in, gets the fruit, leaves. Yeah. And um, leaves some stuff behind. And, and I mean, is this a fruit tree in somebody's yeah. property, in someone's yard? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say any that I, I feel like conflict is kind of always problematic, um, but yeah, it largely dependent on, on context, but that, that is a consideration. Um, but I would say if, if you do have the fruit tree removed, then you're going to need to look at the immediate area as well and make sure that all other attractants are, are concerned. Yeah. He's been like or, 20, sorry, 20 years. So. Is that right? Yeah. Well, and it's not an uncommon story in the Valley here. You know, there's, uh, Bears are, are dear to people in a lot of times, a lot of situations. So it's, um, that's D-E-A-R, not D-E-R. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, it, it does kind of uh, complicate things, um, but all in, I think conflict is conflict. And if we are allowing them to access fruit on trees, it, it, it leads to undesirable behaviors. Um, so ultimately, you know, I have to say, uh, try and manage that attractant. Um, I know it's different in, in kind of every situation a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. It's not always easy, but uh, ultimately we're not doing bears any, any favors by allowing them to access these things. So any of my den brothers and sisters got a query? Yes, Dr. Shannon. Thank you. Um, I just have a question. One of your first slides showed um, when you receive calls about deer, bear, and cougars, and like, I mean, the assumption of the bear and cougars is that they're problematic. I'm wondering about the deer though. Is, is that the deer being problematic for residents or that was a deer found um, after being hit by a car? Or if you could explain that a little bit more, thanks. Yeah, sure thing. So all the reports that appear on that map, uh, any report that is made, it can, it can be made, it can just be a sighting. Uh, it could be uh, any type of conflict. Um, it could be an injured or distressed animal. It could be a um, animal that's you know in, in your yard and it's getting in your garden and you, you don't like that and decide to make a report. So there's kind of a variety of, it's, it's not always like a dangerous one-on-one um, -on -one kind of conflict between uh, humans and animals that's, that is a violent situation. It's just, um, it could be any number of these things. So 84 deer reports is not unusual. It's about on par for the last uh, five years. And uh, yeah, it, like I said, it could be anything. A lot of them are sightings. And I think sometimes people report them um, because there's concern for the animal, um, especially in the areas with high traffic and that kind of thing. Okay, anybody else? 
No. So I managed to hit a bear with my car about a month and a half ago. Oh, dear. And I had a real problem getting a hold of somebody to report it. Okay. And I don't, is that you that I would get a hold of? Or? Um, yeah. I mean, we yeah. would relay any type of thing like that to the rap line, which is the... That's what I did. Yeah. yeah. And you didn't have a, a response? No. Oh, okay. Did you get I mean, the voice? The bear the got up and ran away, looked over his shoulder like you dummy. But uh, right. it... it Still, I was worried that it may be injured. Yeah, the, I mean, the rap line is the place to report that. Certainly, it's unfortunate that nobody got back to you. Was it a voicemail? You no, and the fish and wildlife guy lives a block away from me. I should have just went and knocked on his door. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I can't really uh, speak to what happened there, but um, you, you did the right thing by, by calling to report it, certainly. Yeah. We know the bear had a boo-boo to get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your uh, comments. We appreciate Director it. Director McNabb. And we'll... Uh... Oh, Director Vodner, sorry. <laughs> uh, just, just a short comment. Uh, I walk the trails a lot and go up the mountains and go into remote areas often uh, around the valley. And I must say, I rarely see any scat, so the bear mu bears must all be in town. <laughs> yeah, I feel like most of our, with the amount of bears that we have around here, most of our, our conflict, most of our reports certainly occur, occur like right in the urban core and then out, out along the creeks, you know, out towards Beaver Creek, Cherry Creek, and along Dry Creek and all these wildlife corridors. So, yeah, definitely more conflict in town. The town really draws the animals in. Okay, anybody else? I want to walk away from you. Nope, looking good. So thanks very much for, for your presentation. Keep up the good work. Okay, now we have Mandy Ross, Wildlife BC Brownfield Program Coordinator, uh, the presentation on past year's activities in Brownfield and the wildlife assessment. So we're gonna hear about your activities in Brownfield there, Director Beckett. So I'm gonna report right here. That'll be interesting. <laughs> Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to share the screen. <laughs> oh, there we go. No. Sorry. Do you have your um, presentation open on your computer? I do. It's on on the same bar as the. As yeah. So you have to have that open first, and then at the bottom of your screen, did you find the share screen button? Did yeah, but it seems to be showing. Oh, there it is. Second time lucky. Thanks. Okay. How do I? Make it. Ooh, how do I make it into a slideshow? Why do things disappear when there's an audience? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to make this a slideshow. Mandy, is it the uh, pre present slideshow? But I don't see it. There. I don't see it. Yeah. Oh, there on the maybe. top right. Uh, it says present. Ah. Uh, uh, oops. Sorry. My. He's, sorry. There. The. Those tiles were covering that. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um. Okay, I'm, I'm really glad that Duncan um, went over the history of, of um, Wild Safe BC, which is great because my presentation just launches straight into to Banfield. Um, it was a, a high conflict year this year. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna hit the highlights. I'm gonna look at wildlife activity, the program delivery, um, bear smart community programming, um, and some of the challenges that lie ahead. Um, so we had a lot of conflict with bears um, 
and also with cougars this summer. Um, with bears, the heat dome was definitely a contributing factor, which dried up the berries and brought the bears into town. And once they got into town, um, we had big issues um, with unmanaged attractants. Um, we had a threefold increase in the number of chicken coops um, in Banfield. And I think that was probably to do with food security concerns. But ironically, their food was anything but secure because we had bears that broke into almost every single chicken coop in town. So it was, it was a big problem. Um, I went to try and encourage people to um, get electric fencing to protect their um, coops, but most people opted to just try and reinforce their coops, which unfortunately when you have a bear that's already um, got a food reward from um, something like a chicken coop, uh, it's very hard to prevent them, if not impossible, to prevent them from, from breaking back in um, without an electric fence. Um, so that was, that was um, frustrating. Um, and the garbage bins were the other big issue which contributed to um, creating some uh, habituated bears in town. Um, the bins that were provided by the ACRD, um, they, a lot of them um, were either non-bear resistant or were broken. Um, and so I've been working closely um, with the regional district and they've been great trying to um, replace these bins, but unfortunately there have been supply chain problems. Um, but one of the examples um, of how simple things could be is just um, a simple fix is you look at this bin that has the yellow um, top. Um, the, in order for a bin to be um, bear resistant, the, the bear bar needs to be flipped up and, is, and secured with a carabiner. Um, so what happens here is we, we have people flip them up but not secure them with a carabiner. Um, and so a bear can just open that up. Um, and the other one here is it's got the carabiner, but it's not in the up position. So bears can just open that. So um, something that I'd like to do is try and get some decals on the um, bins, explaining to people how to use them properly. And I think that would go a long way. Um, the other big issues in town are compost um, at people's houses um, and also compost that people throw in the intertidal. People throw them in the water hoping that it'll go out and also the fish refuse from um, fish state fish cleaning stations and they wash back up on shore and then we have bears um, up on uh, up on the shoreline so that those are the main issues that happened this year um, the other issue was uh, cougars we had cougars hunting in town between march and september they were dispersing juveniles from their mother um, and they were being brought into town by attractants. Um, so deer act as an attractant, um, but also once in town, they've got the chicken coops and they've got the rats and the raccoons that are also attracted to the chicken coops and the fish refuse and the compost are also um, creating a big rat problem along the shorelines. Um, and then we had incidental cats disappearing and one dog was killed. So um, it was a big challenge to try and get people to be safe in this situation um, and to call the conservation officers, the RAP line, to let people understand or to, so that we can actually understand the behavior and whether these animals are actually a threat or whether they were just hunting in town. These happen to be juveniles that were hunting in town and they weren't a specific um, threat to people. Um, but it's hard to ascertain that kind of thing without having lots of reports um, to put together. So um, encouraging people to call the RAP line was a big challenge. Um, and so instead of having all these pretty, these pretty graphs that um, Duncan has with Port Alberni, um, because people tend not to call the RAP line in Banfield, um, I just wanted to give an example of um, we had uh, this uh, how many people actually called um there were only seven between january and the end of october there were only seven reports of bears um and 10 reports of cougars and there's significantly more um, activity than that um, so something that i'm trying to do is trying to develop a trust um and get banfielders to actually call in to the rap line um I think traditionally people in Banfield have had the, con the conservation their officers have come out because they need to destroy an animal that's a danger to the community. Um, but what people don't understand is that early intervention um, can allow us to mitigate these issues before they escalate. Um, so this is something that's a big challenge um, in Banfield that I'll be working on. Um, in terms of program delivery, 
Um, Facebook, we continued this, the Wild Safe Facebook page, increasing our followers from last year from 53 to 126, which is pretty good for a tiny town of Banfield. But most people um, were accessed through the cork board, the community cork board. Um, that's how I was able to reach people um, with the situations, like acute situations with cougars and um, in town. Um, and most of the community outreach, I wasn't, I didn't do presentations. It was mostly on site dealing with the actual acute conflict um, and talking to people under those situations um, and also visiting, visiting campsites and talking to people in an informal kind of way. Um, whoops. Um, we were given a grant by Community um, Affairs, grants and aids, um, and we had we were given two, almost two thousand dollars to make signs. Um, education is a huge; is, is going to go a long way in Banfield. Um, so we had uh, those signs. Pardon me; those signs will be made up in January. Um, and we also started up the cost share program again. Um, we were given a thousand dollars per year for the next three years, which will help subsidize 50% of um, bear resistant products. So we produced, we made two, we got two um, fences up. This is one of the chicken coops that was broken into um, and also a uh, composter. And there are three more that are in the process of being put together right now, um, three more orders. So that was, that was good. So the funding will be used up this year. Um, and we've been working, I've been working on the bear, um, becoming a bear smart community. Um, so we did, I did the um, bear hazard assessment of Banfield last year, um, and that was completed and that's been written up. Um, but unfortunately, because of um, COVID restrictions, I wasn't able to do an ACLA. Um, so I was able to do the um, research this year. Um, and um, I'll be writing that up in January. But it was a pleasant surprise about Anacla. They don't seem to have a lot of the issues that Banfield has. The main issue there were the commercial garbage bins. So I think once those are dealt with, that'll make a big difference. Um, and the next step, once the bear hazard assessment is done, is to develop a bear hazard management plan, and that's gonna be with the, the community engagement. And so we'll take the information that we gathered from the bear hazard assessment and apply that and come up with some strategies. Um, um, another thing we, we, I did was promoting the um, bear campsite program. So there are three campsites, one unofficial campsite in Banfield. Um, Eileen Scott campsite. Um, I I did that assessment last year, and this year they'd um, implemented some of the recommendations that I'd made. Um, and next year they plan to do some of the larger recommendations, like buying a shipping container to, in order to store the food and make it that campers have. And um, and a lot of fishermen come to the community, come to um, come camping, and they bring. Um, uh, freezers to put their fish in so which is quite a danger so this is by having a shipping container that'll allow them to secure um to cure those attractants um pachina campsite completed a wildlife hazard assessment there and they they tend to have a lot of similar um challenges that the um eileen scott campsite has um and brady's beach is an unofficial campsite on the west side um and the challenge there is that there is no real agreed upon um, usage by the community, whether it's actually a campsite or not. And because people don't want to encourage people to camp there, they haven't encouraged signage or any um, given anyone the, give people the opportunity to actually store store food safely. So, so this is something that the community really needs to work on: is um, coming up with a bear uh, with a bear smart plan for for Brady's Beach. Um, so the challenges ahead, um, Banfield is a changing community. We could see that this year and it's, it's growing. Um, there are a lot more people coming to Brady's Beach and that's something that, as I said, we need to develop a community, Bear Smart community plan for. Um, I'll be working on the Bear Hazard Management Plan. Um, the transfer station um, has an electric fence that needs replacing. 
we, um, I set up an electric fence, a temporary electric fence in 2018. Um, and this year, um, it's, it's been broken down by September. There are bits of it were breaking off and it wasn't functional. So we definitely need a new transfer station. Um, working on developing a positive relationship with the conservation officers and developing trust between the community. Um, attractive management obviously is a big, big concern. Um, with replacing all the commercial bins with bear resistant ones, it's going to go a long way. Um, but the biggest issue I'd say in Banfield is compliance. I visited a lot of sites and talked to people um, about securing their attractants, but often people didn't do anything. And if having all your chickens eaten wasn't incentive enough, um, it's really challenging to actually get people to change their behavior. Um, so something um, that we definitely need is some bylaws that will encourage people to um, change their behaviors um, and also some enforcement. And that's a big challenge in Banfield too, because we don't have any bylaw enforcement. It was very difficult to get conservation officers to come out. They are incredibly busy um, and spread very thinly um, across the island. Um, so that is, a, that is a huge challenge. So when we're working on the bear hazard management plan next year, um, I hope to really address the bylaw issue, um, whether it's bylaws coming from the regional district or local bylaws, but um, things like having chickens, um, needing to have um, electric fences, mandating electric fences around chicken coops, that kind of thing. Um, because yeah, you can talk to your blue in the face, but you definitely need some, some uh, enforcement there. Um, so that's that my presentation. <laughs> Thanks to um, the Conservation Foundation, the Regional District, and uh, British, the Government of BC for your support. So, got any comments? Director Beckett, I would really like your program at Brady Beach. You don't put up sign, people come, the bears come, the people leave. Works fine. I better jump in before you say something. That, uh, me. I'm only kidding, Chair. Um, I, I first of all, I have to acknowledge and congratulate Mandy for all her work. Um, we are so fortunate um, to have the, the the type of passion and and interest uh, that uh, Mandy has uh, for our, our program. Um, a couple things. Uh, uh, resonated with me in your presentation today, and that's developing that positive relationship um, with the, the conservation uh, officer. Because, you know, I I, uh, um, uh, I, I would agree that uh, my concern with with up until this presentation, you know, calling the conservation officer uh, could be a death sentence for you know the the wildlife, whether it's a bear, whether it's a cougar. But I, I have to tell you that um, with the uh, two uh, juvenile cougars that we had uh, in our community for quite some time, um, and I, I got to meet them both, um, um, the uh, uh, conservation officer did an excellent presentation to community affairs. And it, it was clear that, that their goal and role is not to dispatch these animals um, but to try to change that behavior um, of the human species um, so, to, so to protect um, our, our wildlife. So um, I would agree uh, strongly that uh, education is, is paramount. Uh, the work that you're doing, uh, the signage, uh, getting out and meeting people, um, uh, well done. And it's a uh, uh, a good template uh, for any of the, the communities in our region to, to consider. So, so thank you for that and thank you for your good work um, because I, I love seeing our wildlife and I recognize now that seeing it up close and in person is, is perhaps not what we want to see. We, we want to try to keep it out of our, our more, more urban uh, neighborhoods. So, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. It's a great program, and we're very fortunate to have Mandy at the helm. Thank you, Bob. Mandy, do you uh, could you stop sharing there? Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. I have trouble seeing who's waving their hands. 
There you go. Only had half a director of backups. It was, it was weird. Uh, okay. Anybody else got any questions or comments? The uh, garbage bin thing is kind of interesting that we're shipping bins to an area like that that aren't bear proof to an area like that that aren't bear proof. So that might be something we can look into. That's for sure. For Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, just before we go, the um, and for staff uh, who may be sitting in on this meeting, um, getting an electric fence fixed uh, is not an option at the uh, transfer site. That's absolutely critical. So, uh, Maggie, thank you for bringing that to our attention. And staff, if you could make sure that that is number one priority, uh, I would appreciate that. Oh, sorry, Daniel's got something here. I'll uh, certainly just uh, just echo that I made notes during that uh, that portion. So yeah, we will be following up, um, and uh, also just have some ideas around uh, perhaps tackling next summer with. Uh, we'll see if we can negotiate something with the province to get some educational programs and work experience programs that might fit well with uh, with the Banfield uh, enforcement and camping experience. But uh, I'll take that to staff, and we'll uh, we'll we'll brainstorm and come back to the board. Awesome. Anybody else? So now that I lost my agenda. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Andy, for your uh, presentation. And uh, we'll move on to the next item, which I believe is airport. So as I find it again. Oh, there. Thanks. All righty. Short term lease unlocked. 15 Alberni Valley Regional Airport. Who's the guy on this? I'll take that if Mr. Chair, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, yes, we've received a, a letter of interest uh, from Seth and Quinn Melmuk to lease and develop lot 15 at the Alberni Valley Regional Airport. The purpose of the lease is to build an aircraft welding and fabrication facility. Uh, the applicant has reviewed the available lots at Avra and has decided to pursue lot number 15 to build their hangar facility and fabrication area. Permitted uses under the AVRA zoning are aircraft hangar, aircraft servicing, and maintenance. The applicant has submitted a site plan and building layout for the proposed structure. Um, I'd like to note that this is the last lease lot uh, that is available on the AVRA site. Uh, we've had a, a great run over the last two years and uh, we're also looking at uh, future expansion in that area. So Mark, could I ask you, the, the parking lot that was developed across from the airport across the roadway you know, entrance road, uh, is that available for our use for this type of thing in the future? Uh, yes, we have expansion plans at the moment. Um, we've actually withheld uh, two, actually three lease lot areas to expand across the road into that uh, drag race uh, overflow parking lot. And we can actually develop the entire side, the south side of Airport Road from basically the water tower to the Colson area. We have that capability. Uh, we're currently working on a servicing plan for that and a business case to move that project forward. In the short term, we could be looking at even leasing out uh, lots right along the actual access road to the Colsons at the moment. But as we sit right now, if this is moved through the board, that will be our last airside uh, lease lot on the current airport complex. It's a good news story, actually. Okay, anybody get any questions of Mark? Uh, Director Cote. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to Mark. Great job. Um, it's wonderful to hear that our airport uh, facility areas are full and uh, that we need to start looking at future expansion and uh, the airport uh, committee, Alberni Valley Regional Airport Committee, actually had a tour. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, identifying the, the, uh, all of the areas and, and this site in particular as well and um, where we could expand and explained all of that to the committee. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I could make the motion if you'd like. 
So I just have one question. I don't think there's anybody on this that could probably give me the right answer, but is anybody a sense of what the uh, rural taxation is on one of those hangars when, when they get to a point of being fully developed? Just what it comes back in our pocketbook? Nope. That would be something for Terry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That would be for Terry and we could bring something back to the next meeting on that. Sure, just like. of interest. Great. I mean, sixteen hundred and twenty-six dollars doesn't sound like a bunch of money. So hopefully, we're getting something out of taxation. So, would somebody like to move the motion that's in front of us? Director, uh, I'll make that motion. Seconder. Director Polson. It. And uh, is there any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none. All in favor. Opposed? All you people are opposed? No, okay. Alrighty, that's carried. And now we have the fun and gains of the Somas Watershed Flood Management Plan peer review. So I'll speak to that, Mr. Chair. Um, so we're, we're uh, presenting the, uh, the Somas Watershed Flood Management uh, peer review um, findings, as well as uh, Northwest Hydraulics um, response to the, to the, to the peer, review, peer review for the community. Um, and two recommendations uh, in, in the report. Um, one, to receive the report and then uh, refer to the board of directors for their review. And, and the second recommendation is for staff to investigate mitigation options. And, and I'll speak a little bit more to the mitigation options um, in, in a minute. Um, and, and so the, the purpose of the peer review was to, was to confirm the conclusions of the Somas Watershed Flood Management Plan, which was presented to the board um, last year about this time. Um, and then also to explore the mitigation options um, as directed by the board. Um, and, and, you know, today we're presenting the, the peer review and, and the comments and um, making, you know, making the peer review public. Um, and then also want to be able to answer any initial questions that the uh, board of directors and board members may have. Um, I, I would note that the peer review uh, did confirm the findings um, in the uh, Somas Watershed Flood Management Plan. And um, with respect to mitigation op options, I, I would recommend that the board wait and see um, if there is any direction or any legislation from the province. Um, given, the, given the recent events um, and the flooding that's been happening in the province and, and some of the new art news articles that, that I've seen, um, there has been discussion around what role the province will be taking in uh, flood management in BC. So back in 2003, 2004, the province um, Really got out of the flood management business and um, and you know delegated that um, that authority to local governments and um, th there's been a lot of, of questions and uh, uh, discussion about you know should that approach be revisited. So I would recommend. I mean, we'll certainly look for mitigation options, be looking for what funding is, is available out there. But um, I, I would recommend that no major decisions are made. I mean, no, until we get a sense of where the province is going with uh, flood management. Um, and I think I'll stop there. And I, I do expect there's uh, lots of questions from directors, so I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Okay, I want to do lots of questions. Who's got the question? Director Bodner and Director Good. Thank you. Um, I, I went through that report again now that we have climate change really is here and paid more attention to what I was reading. And I noticed that they, they did um, uh, acknowledge climate change a lot in the report. Um, and, but I noticed on page 45, they mentioned about uh, the dams that we have, uh, any of the dams that we have on Stamp River or Elsie Lake or elsewhere. Uh, it's, they said that they assume that they that the dikes will be able to handle any overflow. However, my question is, or just a thought, is that if there ever was an earthquake, it sounds like they are just taking it for granted and haven't really looked at the infrastructure of the dams. Because if the one, I believe the one at Elsie Lake, if it broke, it could be absolutely catastrophic for the whole valley. And, um, it, and it doesn't mention anything about looking at the infrastructure. A month ago, 
And even though that may sound far-fetched, a month ago, if you told the Abbotsford farmers, hey, in a couple of weeks, you're going to be in a boat swimming your cattle up to higher ground and probably losing half your herd. Um, being concerned about the infrastructure of the dam doesn't sound too, biz too bizarre. So I just thought I'd, I'd mention that anyway. Um, just with respect to the, uh, to the dam, so the, uh, the dams on Great Central Lake, both the one with the stop logs and the saddle dam, are owned by Catalyst. So they, they're owned and managed by Catalyst. Um, I do know that the saddle dam has recently been um, rebuilt. Um, when you're when you're driving out that yeah so it was it was recently rebuilt and the um the dam on Elsie lake which was outside of the scope of this project um that is owned by bc hydro and and also um you know i would say you know was it, it was it's been over 10 years but but that dam was assessed and was also reconstructed um you know within the last maybe in the last 20 years now um so it was assessed for um earthquake um stability so, um, so that has happened, but, but again, um, dam assessment and, and the potential for earthquake was outside the scope of this, of this project. Do you see that, um, that being addressed, the ones that are outside of the scope that would be addressed by the people who are responsible for those dams? Um, so BC Hydro does, does manage and monitor, um, you know, and, and Keep up to date um, on the on, on the dams, and there is also um, through the province there's there's dam safety requirements that the dam orders oh. uh, to, to okay. monitor and follow and report on. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Director Cote. I brought a pillow, so just in case this is like two hours of in depth here. You may need it. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you brought a blanket too. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, I have a lot of questions about uh, this report that came back. Um, th it, there's a lot of inconsistency. It seems that um, Hatch are saying that there was um, pieces of the uh, uh, the review that were password protected so they couldn't contain formulas that were were used. So I have concerns about that. Uh, further in the uh, document, uh, it says that um, Northwest Hydrology <coughs> provided the information that they, they collected, but not the uh, formula. So just how they arrived at their... Um, Conclusions is a question. Uh, would like to have had um, Hatch have access to the whole uh, process that they were identified, but not how to consider them. Um, and it seems like part of it there is including tides. It, it's just, it's a very complex document and how it's broken down. Um, uh, page 35 and 36, there's a, a section that says that this information is not intended to establish setbacks, but um, that's exactly what we're using it for, in my understanding. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'd like some clarification going forward because these setbacks um, really affect the people that live around Sprout Lake. So existing housing that's in the floods, if they decide to raise their new houses, um, what will that new setback level be established at? Will they be able to stay in the existing um, place at their houses situation? Um, and what about new housing? So. It's very, it's very awkward. Um, I have these questions from the community regarding a uh, new build on Lakeshore Road that is probably being built uh, above the Lakeshore Road. So that would be the um, living area would have to be above the road. So, um, and there's a lot of infill that's coming. Um, that piece of property is, is a large piece of property, but it's very long and narrow. So very little uh, space between the foreshore and the road. Um, 
I have a lot of questions from the community about that and how that's working into this. Uh, also questions about how Ministry of Transportation is reacting to this regarding Highway 4, uh, River Road, 3rd Avenue, uh, it must be affecting the city in a major way as well. Um, just so many questions and um, guess not really satisfied with the results of you know, half a million dollars plus the, the, uh, the review um, on what we got for our, our investment. Um, so I, there was quite a few questions there. I'll, I'll uh, wait for staff to answer some of them. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll attempt to address some of them. And, 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 uh, you know, I'll start sort of with the, the, the last ones. Um, so the, the hatch review, um, was was a peer review of the of the SOMAS watershed flood management plan. So it was the plan as well as all of the appendices and the maps that that went with the um, with the review. So the intent of the of the hatch the work you know the work we're looking at today um, it isn't in these reports you know how construction should be developed or, or where it is right. That's that's actually in the original work that, that Northwest Hydraulics did. Um, so so that's that was the purpose of, of the re report. And, and while they, there were some um, items identified by Hatch, um, overall, you know, their conclusions were that the, uh, the, North, the, the plan that Northwest Hydraulics did you know, met, met the requirements that, that the ACRD put out, as well as the, um, the standards for doing this type of work uh, that BC and, and the uh, Professional Engineers Association require, require, require them to do. Um, and as far as, uh, in this report, um, uh, Graham Hill from Northwest Hydraulics provided a response to the peer review and did answer a lot of the questions um, uh, or that, that you addressed, Director Cote. So, uh, you know, some of the specific things are addressed as far as um, what was available, uh, made available to Hatch from peer review um, and sort of how that process went, but also where there was questions about the dams um, and, and things like that, that was addressed. Um, the questions around where flood construction can happen. So once, just as a, a bit of a refresher for everybody, uh, once the ACRD um, had received and made public the, the original um, flood management plan and the flood construction maps that came with it, um, we, uh, there's a section of the community charter that allows the building inspector to, on a case-by-case -case basis, determine if um, if there's a hazard present, and then requiring an engineer um, with the specific qualifications to address that. So, where a construction or build was proposed or being, you know, going to be built within the the new flood construction level identified in the Somers Watershed Flood Management Plan, um, a hydrologist was required to be engaged to address how the construction would happen and um, to confirm, provide a report saying, you know, construction happens in, you know, a set manner, and that if that happens in that way, the, the, it's safe for the intended use, and then that um, report is actually registered on title. So that's been the practice we've been, we've been following now for over a year. Um, so, so that's how those safety things are addressed. So, um, the other question, or one of the other questions you had, uh, Director Cote, was was around setbacks, and then you know what happens if somebody wants to rebuild. So there are things that could happen in the future, um, such as a floodplain bylaw for the rural area. But for the ACRD, would be responsible for the rural area um, of the uh, of our area of the regional district, not with not necessarily with municipalities, um, because we do separate rural land use planning and separate building inspection um, from the municipalities. Um, but a floodplain bylaw um, would address some of those components as far as set um, a certain percentage that could be added to a home that was within a flood construction level or if, if um, improvements or alterations were made to further protect say a home by raising it up, but it didn't raise it to the height, um, the flood construction height, they would allow that. Um, as far as what happens under the current conditions and what would be required by the building inspector, I'm going to get that information um, and have to, I'll report back on that because I think that's a, an important question. If somebody is 
um, within the flood construction level and they want to raise their house a meter or three feet, but they would, you know, at that level, the habitable space would still be within the flood construction level. You know, can they do that? And um, that's something we will, uh, we will look into and, and get back to the board on. Um, and I guess with regard to mitigation and next steps, there's, this affects two components or services within the regional district and, and the municipalities and, and the first, well, the First Nations are separate um, in, in this case, in the flood area. And, and that there's the rural planning and building inspection, which is just an electoral area director's service. So um, there's, you know, the building inspection, the rural planning, OCPs can address some of those things, a floodplain bylaw. Um, and then there's there's regional mitigation options where, where um, that can happen in cooperation or in consultation or collaboratively with the city of Port Alberni, First Nation, Sea Shock Defense, and potentially the Ministry of, of Transportation. Uh, we have shared the, um, the report and the flood mapping with the uh, with the pro with the province, so specifically the Ministry of Transportation. Um, and the provincial approving officer who works with the Ministry of Transportation. So they have that information. So they, they take that into account when they're doing new development or subdivision um, reviews. So they have that information as well. Um, so I'm not sure if I got answered all the questions of those ones I could recall. And, and I'm happy to answer more, uh, more questions if, if I missed anything. So my question is, what's this gonna do to insurance around these areas? Um, you know, we see that uh, you know the situation in the in, in the low, on the lower mainland, and I know when I got my house insurance, it said that eighty percent of all claims are water related claims. Um, so, a report like this that basically says that pretty much seventy percent of the houses in Sproul Lake are probably too low. What's what's anybody looked into that in any way? No, that is not something that we have um, have any information on. Um, you know, as far as how insurance companies are dealing with it, I, I think one of the things I would note is that the the two hundred year flood is the two hundred year flood. It's, you know, it, it's what it was before we knew um, the outcome of the report. It, it's still the same. The science still would lead to the same conclusion. We just have more information, and then can move forward with um, development in a way that takes this into that. Uh, takes this into account so that, you know, ensuring that, that construction happens in the uh, most appropriate manner and, and relying on uh, you know, site-specific um, engineering analysis um, for construction right now as well. I think it's, it's something that's that's important um, and, and can just improve um, what's being built. I mean, you know, current, and we'd seen this before, the, the elevation um, based on the information that was in the zoning bylaws or prior to having this, uh, the SOMAS flood management plan and the flood construction levels were too low. I mean, you know, the results of this, we realized that it was, it was three meters, it was a 10 foot difference as far as where the flood construction level is. And some of that can be can be mitigated um, by the engineering reports and, uh, when somebody's doing a specific build and we're seeing that. Um, and, you know, the differences are if it's a, a hard surface or, or sort of a one, solid riprap wall, the construction has to have, happen higher um, versus come, rip, come, uh, the wave and flood coming up over say a grassy lawn. Um, so some of, you know, some of those things are factored into um, the new construction that's happening as well. Okay, I've got Director Shannon. Thank you. Um, actually, um, you, you kind of asked my question. I was going to ask about, um, how this report would affect insurance, but that sounds like a discussion for down the road when we start talking about the bylaws and how to move forward with these things. So thank you. Yes. If, if I can add to what was said so far, I, I, at a staff level, the discussion that is going to take place around mitigation is also going to take a look at some strategies that, that we can do, that the region can do in collaboration with key partners, uh, like Mike said. Um, but it'll also consider different things and different proposals that individual property owners can do. And I, I think it's, it's important to flag that some property owners will want to take action on their property. And for us as a region to be able to make recommendations as to 
what standards to follow, what uh, frameworks uh, we would prefer seeing um, is, is something that we can do as a region to encourage and enable individual property owners beyond just regional action. And so, uh, you know, a report like this is, is, is quite significant and that it, it will take quite a bit of time for us to work through. Um, insurance companies tend to take whatever information is available to them uh, to recalculate risk. And, and so uh, whether that be our own municipal insurance association or that, whether that be private practice, uh, typically with what we'll see across the province is a reassessment of, of uh, insurance for all British Columbians, frankly, uh, around water and, and flood um, and, uh, and climate change, I think globally, we're, we're all going to see impacts um, on, on our insurance uh, premiums and the different coverage that has taken place. This one report in and of itself is, isn't necessarily going to make it like that, but it will help inform different companies that want to use that public information. Okay, anybody else? We got a Richard Cote. Thank you. Um, I would like to hear from staff to we've had an, a couple of um, applications since um, we've had this new setback in in place. Um, it would be nice to have a report on uh, what it's adding to the cost of doing business to actually build in our area as well. I've heard up to uh, $50,000 to get a geo report on or whatever that the person needed to uh, be able to, to build um, <clears throat> with this, these new setbacks. So um, that's, I think that's quite important to uh, us going forward to know what the, it's adding to the cost to, uh, to build in our communities. Um, and uh, I'd like to see us um, staff looking for uh, another grant possibly to uh, investigate um, about uh, the Weir and Bob's Rock. And um, the study that was done was done for a 200 year event, which doesn't really take into consideration a little bit of a holdback, but um, on a yearly basis now, knowing that climate change is, is changing, um, we're not gonna get that, hopefully not gonna get that 200 year event but um, there is a, a consistent change in the weather and the water levels. So um, it would be very important to know um, how the effects of um, that the weir actually doing, keep putting the plates in, taking them out, if the weir was out, if Bob's Rock was gone, a shorter term um, review of what, uh, what mitigation at, in that area would do and the effects, it, it, what the effects are on the houses at Sprout Lake that are flooding and the effects of what would happen if we did anything uh, downstream because he shot uh, properties along the river and uh, Sprout Lake can be very well uh, effect in, in the, that catchment effect zone. So um, I'd like to see if we could get a um, look for another grant um, and that is uh, staff's recommendation to investigate mitigation options and I think that that would sort of include this. Thanks. So one thing I heard in this all this conversation on uh, Chilliwack and Abbotsford was one fellow said it was supposed to be a hundred year flood and it's only been five years. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, I'd like to move this, uh, get this recommendation that we've got in front of us to uh, move it along a little bit. I understand that we have uh, further things to do with regards to all of this, looking at what do we do from here. And I think staff is going to look at, investigate the mitigation options and find out what we can actually uh, do to make these things less erroneous. So uh, if somebody could move one of these motions, we'd be going a little bit. Yep, Kurt Cote, are you moving? Uh, one more thing. Okay. Uh, Gray Central Lake um, has dams, has uh, the saddle dam and it has the, the block dam. Um, and 
I don't think that that was really taken into consideration when um, the, the uh, Northwest Hydrology report was done. Um, it, it's, from what I can read, it's, it's very prescriptive and very um, technical reports. So I'm not a hydrologist and, and have to go by, <clears throat> by reports, what reports bring to me. And I don't, I didn't see that information being made available. So I'd like to also include um, further investigation in other areas um, like Great Central Lake um, with their ability to monitor or regulate the water with the dam. And also um, uh, investigating also along the river banks because of the erosion that's happening. I think that that's also something that we really need to start looking at. Um, so it wouldn't be just the, the uh, Weir and Bob's Rock that I'm, I'm asking about. Um, but I would be, I would at this time uh, uh, move the recommendations. Do you want them both at the same time or? So to receive the re hatch report. Okay, move to receive the hatch report. Okay. And the second earlier, Ron Polson. Uh, did you want to input anything there? No, okay. Already, anything else on receiving the hatch report? All in favor? All opposed? Carry. And now we have a recommend that the board of directors gets that the staff investigate mitigation options. So moved. And uh, same, Cote and Paulson. Anything else on that? Ron, you got something? You're locked up by the looks of it. Sorry. Hope not everybody is, Ron is. Okay, all in favor? And Ron's obviously in favor. He's voting. Oh, so uh, it's carried. So it seems to, the oh, next, there we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Did you have something to say? or please? Yes, actually, just um, to follow up on some of Penny's comments and stuff. Um, once again, I, I went through the report and I found the report um, very, very technical in nature. And the fact that we're moving this on to the directors, this is a subject I think that warrants some discussion um, all on its own. And may, perhaps staff might consider um, a committee the whole on this particular subject. Uh, we could go on for hours talking about uh, specific areas and, and things. But to be quite honest, um, I read through the report and just the average layman, uh, I need this dummy down a bit. Uh, for myself, just uh, for pure understanding and probably a more concise summary. And um, that would just be my suggestion is that uh, perhaps we, uh, we set aside uh, time to discuss this particular subject. And um, I mean, we talked about Sprout Lake, a bit about um, Great Central, and uh, we, we certainly need to talk about downstream effects and those sorts of things. But I found the report fairly technical in nature. I had to Google seiches. I didn't understand what seiches were, but they're, it's just um, movement of water in a lake. It's uh, quite often due to winds and those sorts of things. But uh, I, that's my own personal view. I think that we need a more fulsome discussion on this once it gets to the director's level and maybe we could entertain um, a committee of the whole discussion overall. Because certainly this also entails uh, tsunami inundation, uh, the West Coast, uh, there's, it's quite broad, but um, just maybe something we could consider uh, moving forward. Thanks guys. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly think that it's something that we should have as an individual item and broken down by somebody so that we can understand it. I mean, my hydrology experience has got to do with the steering box and a C10 pickup, so it's kind of a little different. So I, I think we need to put it in plain language and, uh, and the, what we've discovered and how we need to react to it. And uh, I think staff should uh, probably look at having a meeting with, uh, with the Alberni Valley Committee and Banfield uh, um, to discuss this in, in whole. 
later. So I don't know if we need a motion for that, or we can just take care of it down the road. Okay, somebody would like to move that? So, Director Polson, Director Beckett, all in favor? Carried. Okay, so now that we got through that, I think, we are now on to more streams, three streams of waste service update. Hopefully these streams are not flooding the market. Jody, are you on? Or are you trying to get on? I am on. Are you seeing the right screen? I don't think so. No, you're, we don't have you carrying a screen. We do. It kind of looks like it's in your living room. No. How about now? That's good, Jody. Thanks. Okay, you see the right screen? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Jody Frank, the Regional Organics Coordinator for the ACRD. Um, so, the presentation today is basically to outline the report um, for information around the Alberni Valley Electoral Area uh, Three Stream Waste Service and to provide you with a bit of an update with a proposed engagement and consultation process for the electoral areas um, with the intention to determine if there's an interest in the electoral areas for a roadside three stream collection service. So as most of you will be aware, in 2020, um, the ACRD received a $6 million grant to provide funding for the introduction of a regional organics diversion program. So part of that, we, um, we basically split the organics diversion program into three phases. So the, uh, the first phase being um, City of Port Alberni, that was launched this September, 2021. Um, and over the first 10 weeks of the program, 465 tons of organic waste has been diverted already. Um, it's increased our diversion rate from approximately 20% to 65. Um, and on average, residents of the city of Port Alberta are diverting about 14% of recyclables and 51% of organic waste. Um, so that Right now, 65% of what is going or was going to the landfill is, is now being diverted, which is um, great success in such a short time. Um, Post-implementation for phase one, the ACRD and the city of Port Alberni are continuing to educate residents on proper sorting and disposal. We have just recently launched an online sorting contest to help residents with um, determining what goes where. Um, and we continue to do school presentations and community group info sessions. Um, we continue to monitor and evaluate um, program information on contamination, which helps us inform our education program. Phase two um, is the West Coast. So this is currently what we are um, in the process of, of scoping. Um, we are working with Tetra Tech at the moment, who is um, helping with the design of an organics compost facility out on the West Coast. Um, and engagement with West Coast communities is to begin in the new year. So we're looking at mid-January um, to inform and educate with West Coast communities on the new proposed um, three stream service. So we're looking at collection taking place for phase two, approximately November, 2022. And then phase three brings us to the Alberni Valley and, and Banfield. Um, and so that's the focus of the report um, in front of you is the Alberni um, Valley and, and um, the electoral areas. So prior to developing the scope of the program, it's really important um, to determine basically the degree of interest in each electoral areas for such a service. 
Um, so what we are proposing is engagement and consultation with residents, um, which I'll continue to explain in more detail throughout the presentation. Um, we've already began um, as part of our next steps to talk to local haulers um, who currently um, are contracted for private waste hauling to begin the conversations on just what a program um, would potentially look like in the electoral areas. So as we um, move forward with engagement and co consultation, um, if interest in the service is determined through this process, um, we are looking at implementation about spring 2023. So this also um, is in line with the grant funding requirements, which will expire, um, I believe it's March 2023. So I'm sure you've seen this slide a bit over the, the, the past few presentations, um, but it does a really great job at basically um, providing the information, the background information as to why a program like this is so beneficial. Um, when we look at the composition of our waste, we see that you know around 50% can be diverted. Um, and what that means is if we were to take those uh, divertible streams out of our garbage going to landfill, we can increase our waste diversion. Um, and so we've had a goal of a 50% diversion for some time now, and we've been sitting at a stagnant 20%. So, um, statistics from City of Port Alberni shows us that if we take those organics out, we can really increase that, that diversion goal. Um, and then that leads us into goal number two, which is achieving our per capita disposal rate of 400 kilograms per year. So right now, each person in the Alberni Valley um, is generating about 589 kilograms of waste per year. Um, we really want to get that down to 400. And then even if we can get it down a little bit more to, to meet the provincial target of 350. So looking at those two goals, it takes us into goal number three, which um, by increasing what's diverted from the landfill and reducing waste generated, we can then expand the life of our landfill um, by possibly 35 years, which is great um, for our next generation. And then leading into goal number four, by removing those um, organics and other materials from the, the landfill, we are um, going to reduce the landfill gas produced by diverting the materials. Um, so that's how this sort of service would, would tie into our, our program goals. Some other benefits really um, that aren't highlighted here are things like a reduction of illegal dumping on streets and in trails. It improves our neighborhood aesthetics by keeping these materials contained um, in carts or other receptacles. It reduces fire hazards um, associated to the buildup of yard waste and forested areas. Um, it reduces the human wildlife interaction. Um, it reduces open air burning of waste materials um, and reduces the individual trips, um, self haul trips to the landfill to drop off waste material and yard waste. In turn, again, reducing those GHGs that are producing or uh, being produced. and which improves our air quality. Um, and then lastly, it produces a useful compost material amendment um, from material that was previously waste. So when we look at um, what a three stream service would look like, so um, basically we're looking to engage with um, Alberni Valley communities prior to developing the scope of a project, a three stream project. So prior to, to putting carts on the curb, um, we need to, to determine the degree of interest in each of um, our electoral areas and First Nations communities. Um, the overview of the three stream waste service would include providing um, the three stream carts at the curb. So that would include your organics, recycling and garbage. Um, we would look at servicing approximately 3,000 uh, single family households that are part of our electoral areas. And it's also important to note that the ACRD is considering the implementation of an organic span at the landfill um, in 2023 or beyond at some stage. Um, curbside or roadside collection would offer a management op option for restricting those materials from entering the landfill um, and potential financial um, penalties. 
So next steps, um, what the report highlights is basically our plan for um, engagement with the various electoral areas in the Alberni Valley. Um, so in order to achieve success with implementation of a new way service, it's important for us to develop a strong engagement strategy um, and an opportunity that would allow the ACRD to collaborate with the community and gauge a level of interest um, for a new waste service. It also gives us an opportunity to educate again on those goals um, that we saw previously as to why something like this is so important. Um, and also to determine the barriers um, and rationale for why people might be opposed. Um, the engagement process will also help us determine if a new service can be established in these areas, so in all areas or potentially in selected areas and First Nations communities. Um, so with that being said, the engagement plan and outreach planning that we've put together um, has a focus on achieving two main goals. Um, and those goals are to inform Alberni Valley residents about the goals to increase waste diversion and what um, a roadside collection service would look like. And then to our second goal is to consult with residents about the implementation um, of a program. And so the objectives to meet these goals, um, to inform. So the first goal, the objectives would be to provide updates on the diversion goals and current statistics and to inform residents about potential service options and the estimated costs. Um, moving on to goal number two, objectives there to create opportunities area by area for residents um, to indicate their interest for service. And then secondly, um, to promote, promote an opportunity using various range of tools, which I'll go over in the next slide, um, to achieve a strong response rate. The main communication activities that we're proposing um, for engagement and outreach. So um, firstly, to inform residents um, about our waste diversion goals and um, what roadside collection opportunities exist. Um, we are working on creating and promoting our online information hub, so Let's Connect. Um, we're revising our Let's Connect so that it's incorporating, now that we moved on to West Coast and the Alberni Valley, we've got three separate um, project pages that are being developed. So one specific to City of Port Alberni, one specific to the West Coast, and one that'll be specific to Alberni Valley in this engagement process. Um, we are currently developing um, various mail outs with um, informational um, facts. Um, we'll continue to um, create our FAQs and info sheets and put out um, various articles through our, our social media and other um, uh, uh, outlets such as radio and news articles. Um, and then obviously identify opportunities to be able to support their directors in sharing information. When we look at consulting and generating data on the interest of implementation of the three stream program, um, our, our main tool here is going to be through a survey mechanism. So um, I'll share with you in my next couple of slides here, um, some of the survey questions that we're proposing. Um, and we're running a contest obviously to really generate and promote um, people to take part in filling out the survey. Um, so that's, sort of in process right now, developing and posting the survey um, with contest information, draft, um, a press release to basically get the word out there that engagement is underway. Um, we plan on hosting informa information sessions. So these will be a series of in-person um, town hall um, info sessions, as well as online for um, individuals that still prefer the, the online um, interaction. Um, various um, information packets um, that we can distribute at the landfill uh, to be able to promote the survey. Um, and then again, developing various um, media advertising through print and radio and social media. Um, so with that being said, I'll just walk you through. Um, we've come up with, we wanted to keep the survey relatively short so that it's not overwhelming for people to fill out. Um, so I'll just run through um, the, the 10 main survey questions that are 
that we've developed. Um, so basically the first one is where do you live? That gives us a sense of electoral areas and which ones um, may be interested or not. Um, and a series of questions around what do you currently do with your garbage? Um, what do you currently do with your recycling? And what do you currently do with your kitchen and food waste? So we've got options for pre, um, preempted responses or fill in the blank answers if, if something's not included. Um, what do you currently do with most of your yard waste? Uh, so that's separate from obviously kitchen and food waste. Um, are you interested in a roadside collection service? Yes or no? If no, please let us know the main reason the service isn't of interest to you right now. So again, a number of pre-populated um, options and a fill in the blank. And then on a scale of one to 10, interested, um, one uninterested and 10 being very interested. And then should a roadside collection service not be implemented in your area, how will you manage your organic kitchen and yard waste um, if it is no longer accepted at the landfill in a, at approximately 2023? And then tell us about your community, why um, would or wouldn't you be a good, or would your community be a good uh, candidate for roadside collection? So with that being said, so those are some of the preliminary survey questions that we've developed. Um, and we would be looking to run the survey from January 10th to 31st. Um, so really launching our communications right after Christmas. We didn't want to do anything pre-Christmas, just given the holiday. And um, communication is usually oversaturated with holiday messaging and, and whatnot. So um, after the new year is kind of when we're going to um, uh, push push the launch of our communication. And then in town, um, or sorry, in-person town halls and online info sessions will take place the week of January 24th. So currently in, in the phase of um, trying to put those in place now. Um, so with that being said, that's basically the, the high level um, outline of the report on consultation. Um, and I guess I can leave it up to, to questions. So, Director Bodner and yeah, Director Cote. Thank you. Um, uh, it was a good, a good example and easy to understand your presentation. Uh, but I have been recycling, so it, it makes sense to me. If you're going to be talking to people out in the area and, uh, and seniors, I think you have to keep in mind to look at it in a holistic way. Um, well, before I get into that, uh, what percentage of the, um, of the um, population in a certain area would you say, okay, we're going to go to the three-tier three, three tier system? Or w so, would you do it by percentage? Um, well, that's something that we still have to determine. Um, but I, so if we're going um, electoral area to electoral area, so if we have um, you know, once we have survey responses and we can say, you know, um, you know, a hundred of the people that responded, we will bring those statistics to back to the board to kind of move forward with, um, we need to determine how many responses we're going to get first and then determine if that's a significant amount to go forward with the service. And so obviously bringing that back to the board to, um, for decision. Okay, and I think um, one of the questions people are going to be asking is, uh, what is it going to cost? What is it going to cost for me to do this? Um, something, too, is um, uh, because our world is changing so much now, we're, we're all dealing with climate change and we're dealing with COVID as well, I think. All of this looks very good on paper in such and such a time we'll do this, such and such a time. But I think it was important to be able to have some leeway uh, as to how, you know, some people may be, be very slow to respond. Um, they've, they've got enough on their plate to deal with right now. Um, and also perhaps breaking things down a bit more into what, what do you do with your recycle? And perhaps giving examples of what, what means, what does recycle mean? Um, uh, what, are, what are some examples? And um, 
How are other communities dealing with uh, this situation and dealing with the uh, electoral areas? So I just, those are some questions that I, concerns that I thought I would bring up. Thank you. Um, so as far as costs go, we're exploring costing options right now. So it, we're looking at about $250 um, per year per household. Um, so that's very close in line with what um, the, the private hauler is is charging um, or could charge. But we are looking at those numbers now and they will be part of our consultation. So we will have those numbers um, available to the public when we um, prevent or present the surveys and information to the public. So that's definitely something we are going to communicate. Um, when we talk about what is recycling and what does it look like, it's basically the same curbside program that the rest of BC operates under. So um, your, uh, your milk jugs, your clamshell, your food packaging, basically, and then the same materials like your soft plastics, your bread bags, um, your crinkly plastics, those will still continue to go um, to the depot. Um, so you'll have the same curbside program that the city of Port Alberni has. Um, and the and the rest of BC communities really, um, so I hope that answers some of your questions. I, I thanks, Jody. I'm just thinking that when you're in your survey, putting in a couple of, of examples of what recycling is. Okay. I, I, that's. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Cote. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that presentation. Uh, I think it's wonderful for the city. Um, to have this in place and uh, congratulations on that. Uh, in your report, there's uh, on page 75, there says public support and it talks about a recent survey um, on Let's Connect. Uh, and there's uh, some statistics um, in there. It would be nice to have had a breakdown on that. Was there anyone from Sprout Lake that actually submitted to that that res response? So I believe there was about um, 40 responses. Um, and so I can provide a, a breakdown to you because um, I, I do believe it breaks it down a little bit into electoral areas. But because of the low responses, it's, it's you know, a bit hard to, um, to, to really break it down. But I, um, I can follow up and provide that to, to the directors. Okay, uh, I'd just like to follow up. Um, I've been talking with my community for many years about garbage pickup and then garbage and recycling pickup um, and have not had any um, indication from the community that they want to have this. Um, and so I started asking for reasons. Um, and one of the reasons is, uh, well, a couple of the reasons, 50% absentee owners, they won't be using it. They don't need, they don't require the service. Um, and another one was the properties here, a lot of them are very um, large properties, long driveways, and they all go down to the lake, towards the lake. So to get your garbage or recycling or organics to the roadside to be picked up is quite a feat to go uphill in a lot of those circumstances. So some of the responses I had was, I'm gonna be loading it into my vehicle anyways. I'm just gonna carry it on and continue on the way that I have been doing. So, um, and I recently talked to the Sprout Lake Community Association directors and uh, we tried to have you as a uh, guest speaker, but uh, that didn't work out. We'll be doing it again soon. Um, another th re thing is in January, there is a lot of absentee owners here and they won't be able to participate unless you do almost direct mail. And now that um, the borders have opened up, as long as they do remain open, there's a lot of people heading south. So um, that's another um, issue that I'm, I'm hearing about. Um, but I love it in the city and love to be able to have that uh, option to be able to drop off because people aren't in this area haven't really been responding in an open way they like to recycle um, they like to do their own backyard composting um, but yeah thanks 
Thank you. Um, and if I can just uh, uh, briefly comment. So um, the regional district of Nanaimo recently just implemented their automatic curbside program too. So we are going to be working with them on some of the, the lessons learned and best practice methodologies that they've experienced. So we have their information to be able to pull from to help support um, you know, implementing a service like this in rural communities, which I think is really beneficial. Um, the vacant properties, I, I totally understand that. And that's why um, hopefully with the survey, what it will allow us to do is, um, and I've heard with Sprout Lake, there there's not a large interest in this type of service, A, because they're so close to the landfill already, a lot of people self-haul. Um, and with the vacant properties, a lot of them are vacation rentals. So we, um, we are sort of scoping out some program related scenarios with uh, the West Coast because they're a vacation rental community as well and experience um, not so much any more vacant properties, but sort of in this down season, um, that is something that we are looking at exploring different um, options for communicating to those homeowners. Um, so we are doing a direct mail out to homeowners. So it hopefully will reach um, as many people as we can so that they can take part in the survey. Um, so if their main resident isn't here, it will go to wherever it is. But if they're, you know, on holiday or, you know, um, now that borders are open, I totally get wanting to, to get on a holiday. <laughs> um, so I appreciate um, that feedback and we'll um, address as many of those comments as we can. I have one more question, if I might. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the $250, is that um, just for the organics pickup? So oh, that'll be for the three streams. So that'll be for um, organics weekly pickup, recycling, and garbage bi-weekly pickup. So it'll be for all three streams. All three. Because I just want to uh, repeat that I keep hearing that people are not happy with having to pay for two bags uh, minimum. Still, it's not going away. <laughs> so uh, I've got a couple of comments. Uh, one of them is I think that a key factor in the education of this has to be that at some date, and we can identify that date, that organics are not going to be permitted within the garbage tray. And so whether that's the, you know, December 31st, 2022, or what it is, it needs to be out there that they're going to have to find a way to separate it. If they're, whether they're going to uh, do their own composting or or whatever, it just can't go into the garbage stream. Uh, the other thing that I really would like us to change is the reference to uh, our recycling facility uh, as a landfill. And so I, I don't want to see that in there as far as this communication is concerned. So I think it's it's pretty key that we that we come up with a, an alternate. I just come up with Alberni bulk uh, collection facility, uh, which is far better than a landfill. So it, it it's something that we talked about a couple of months ago. And we really need to get wheels underneath that so that we're going forward. We're not portraying something that we're digging a hole and burying this stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's it. I mean, I, I agree with some of the other comments with regards to Beaver Creek. Yeah, some of the driveways are a city block or more long. Uh, so there is going to be hurdles that have to be managed if, if people are going to actually come on to, uh, to three streaming it. You know, I'm doing it myself in the city right now, and it's uh, it's amazing how much uh, recycling I get in that recycling bin. I mean, it's it, it, we did it yesterday. My bin was full, a big bin of recycling. The 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 organics part of it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm having about six or eight bags of organics, but they're not ending up in the in the, in the garbage and contaminating whatever else I might have. That could be recycled. So uh, it's it's something we have to get our heads around. And in areas that are affluent areas, a lot of these people have come from other areas that already are on board with recycling. And it's just, it's the way we have to go. And if we're going to save our, uh, our bulk collection facility, 
for the for the future, we really need to be looking into this and getting it done. So that's it for me. I don't know if anybody else has got. Yes, Kirk Rodner. Thank you. Uh, just one more thing I wanted to ask: Would if, would you be phasing this in, if it if this goes? Would you be phasing it in slowly, where maybe they would be doing um, like the recycle and the garbage for till they get used to that, and then add the organics like you've done in the city? Um, well, that would be something we would have to um, look at once we get past the do they want the service or not? But best practice is that with behavior change, you get them diverting at once, right? So it's a matter of um, if, if you bring on organics after, it's they've already gotten to the behavior of disposing the organics, but if you bring these carts on and you get them diverting um, as the new way of, of your waste management, you have way better success than um, sort of phasing in a, a couple streams here and there because you let people get complacent into um, a routine already. So if you bring in, um, you know, all three streams at once, you just have a better success rate. Whereas with the, with the city, because people were already doing um, garbage and recycling, um, bringing in the recycling cart wasn't a big, big issue. It was bringing in this new big, because they were so used to doing the recycling already. Um, and then it was all this big green bin um, and there was this hesitation around it. But now that people have gotten used to it, um, it becomes business as usual. But so it's it's better just to get a good kick at the can all at once and get them sorting, um, especially if it's, you know, if if you're trying to do that behavior change, it's just a lot easier to do it all at once. Mm, interesting. Thank you for that. OK, any other questions? Director Shannon. Thank you. Um, I, I apologize for missing part of the presentation, Jody. I had to run and get my daughter from the bus. I understand. Um, I, I have a question about um, at the landfill. Sorry, John, for using that word. Um, <laughs> when we're no longer accepting organics or yard waste in the garbage collection stream, is there still going to be an organic spot and a yard waste spot at the landfill? So people who are self-hauling, there's still a spot for that to go. We're just gonna, it's just going to be diverted out of the garbage, correct? That's correct. So it's very much like the cardboard ban that's in place. There's um, an area at the... <laughs> waste management facility? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for it to go. But if you're bringing, you know, black garbage bags and you get spot audited, let's say that's the process and there's organics in it, then, um, you know, there could be penalties associated with that. But if you're coming to clearly divert and you've got it separated and it's going into, you know, the transfer area, um, then that is something, yeah, there'll be a designated, whether it's Earthland and Sea or the transfer station at the landfill as an option. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I do have another question, if I may. Um, so I know that, I mean, in conversations that I've had with some residents out in Beaufort, um, some that live more out the end of Beaver Creek where it's larger properties, um, there's a lot of people doing their own composting and are dead set against a service like this because they don't want to pay for it. And they're doing a lot of it already because they've got the space for it and the knowledge to do it just because of gardening, farming, that kind of thing. But my question is, is because I, on this more south end call it of Beaufort, um, I, and this is just something I've been pondering while we talk about survey results, is it's a little bit more densely populated there, especially at the topic it sucks us in that area. And there's, I mean, I don't know if we can divide boundaries, but those that are within Cherry Creek Fire and Cherry Creek Water, there may be more interest there for a service like this. I haven't heard a lot from that side, but if there is, I'm just wondering if there's a way where if, if a lot of people at Beaver Creek, from what I'm hearing, are not wanting it, but there is an area there, if that's an option for us to kind of split that with those other boundaries or not. Again, I don't know if it might be a no, it might be a yes, but just just an idea that I had. For sure. And it, it is something we've talked about um, for exploring options 
for that that specific scenario. Um, we we have talked to an individual that works for the city that's kind of like I can see like this end of of Beaufort wanting the service and this end not wanting it. So we are going to go through this preliminary consultation period um, and determine what sort of information we're getting from residents. And then we'll explore options like you mentioned on, you know, if we can accommodate um, a, a boundary cutoff like that to definitely explore bringing on some of the residents if we is, can. Okay. And if I may on top on that, is there an option um, when the survey goes out to try and kind of put that in there, if they're in that more condensed area or not. I mean, I know we're getting kind of down to nitty gritty, but. Um, but if we're going to the trouble to put the survey out there, if there's a way we can split like Beaufort area A and B, then, um, you know, if that's gonna serve us a benefit in the long run, then um, I think now's the time to, to, to do it essentially. Okay, okay, thank, thank you. you. So. This is the collection jar for the next person that calls it a landfill. 25 cents. So um, the one thing I'd like to mention again uh, is that when we send this notice out, it has to be a completely different color than anything else we send out. Like Beaver Creek sends out their water bills, it's usually white and blue. So this thing needs to be green or red or something so that it stands out because I've noticed that when we've sent things out like I just a letter with it nobody reads it they, absolutely absolutely and if you notice the nice bright orange in my template yeah, with the presentation a, and the, the big stand header across the top of it that says this is important so something yeah. And, a, and, and something that's not in an envelope, we found that things that get hidden in an envelope don't get open. So we're trying to make this a, a different material and something that's going to stand out so people read it, for sure. Okay. Thanks. So anybody else got a question? Dr. Shannon. Thank you. Um, just on the note of mail out, I've heard from the last couple mail outs that we've done, and I just want to throw this out there again, like when it was the burning bylaw or the zoning bylaw, like it looked great and it said go to the website, but the feedback I got was there's a whole other blank side of the paper. Couldn't they put the highlights of what some changes might be and some information actually on the mail out so I can read it instead of having to go to the website and find it? I might do that for more information, but just like a summary on the mail out itself would be super helpful. Great. Okay, anything else? Dr. Minions. Thank you. Um, just wanted to thank everyone for the conversation on this. Um, I, I wanted to share from the city's experience that um, we had a lot of hesitancy and pushback um, and recognizing that it's a, a much easier uh, jump for the city um, and re city residents who already have garbage pickup, who already, I, I know there's recycling in the regional district as well, but who are already used to this system. And we still had a lot of pushback. Um, but I will say that in the seven years I've been on council, um, this is actually the thing that I have seen the most people change their minds on. Um, and I have been just blown away by the positive feedback that has come once the system was implemented. Um, I'm not saying it's gonna be the same for the regional district. I get that some of the outlying areas have very unique um, differences that you know make this either work or not work. Um, but I, I think it's just so important to keep a really open mind on this service because it has been just shocking how much buy-in we've gotten from our, our community residents. Um, and largely I wanna um, thank everyone who's been involved in, in implementing it because the clear implementation and communication is I think why the program has been so successful. Um, I said this when Jenny came to our council meeting last week as well, but um, yeah, you know, the, the communications that were put out, the QR code um, on, the, on the garbage cans and the pamphlet that came when the bins were de delivered, everything has been just so easy to follow. And I've had just endless feedback from community residents who have been really impressed and um, just happy with the ease of use. And a lot of people have said, I was totally opposed to this and so happy that we have it now. So um, again, I know it won't necessarily go exactly the same way, but I think you'll end up with a lot more buy-in from your, your residents. Um, where it does make sense than you might expect. And that certainly has been my, my uh, experience. So thank you. Okay. 
I don't think we have a motion that we need to do other than receive the report. Director Cogan. I have a question. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so just a couple of more questions. Um, so will there, do you think that there will be a private option for those small percentage at Sprout Lake that would like pick up um, on the three stream or, um, and, and I also have another question regarding the city of Port Alberni uh, as far as uh, residential apartments. Do they have, are they, do they have that option? Because I haven't seen it. Thanks. Um, so in response to your first question about, um, I guess the opt-in, opt-out private. So um, we haven't gotten that far yet with program scope, but I know that just poses a lot of challenges, especially for the hauler. So it's either an area does it or it doesn't just because having to do ad hoc, ad hoc houses becomes really time consuming and, and not overly efficient. Um, so that is something, again, we can, you know, sort of weigh the pros and cons and come back with a recommendation, whether it's something we consider or, or not. Um, and then your second question with regard to multifamily. So multifamily typically falls under um, commercial hauling. So it's not typically something that's undertaken by a city service, which is why it's not included with um, the city of Port Alberni. Um, so stratas that are owned by the, the property owner, um, some of them are in scope with the city of Port Alberni, but, but when we look at multifamily rental properties, that is a commercial based um, service. And so eventually we will get to the commercial sector um, and ask that they provide waste management plans on how they are managing waste recycling. And once the organic bans in place, um, organics within these multifamily facilities, but that's a little bit down the road once these three phases are implemented. Okay, motion to receive the report. So moved. Seconder, somebody. Wagner. Okay, so any other questions on receiving the report? All in favor? Carried. And I don't see that we've got anything else. So this is the longest meeting that I've chaired. So we've got something else? Yeah. Oh, where's that? Forgot about me. Ah, poor Heather's been waiting there. Are you there, Heather? I am, yep, thank oh, you. Oh, there you are, sorry. That's okay. I'm just gonna I, share my I screen. I've got on here, it doesn't show it after this, so yeah, sorry. It's okay. Can somebody tell me if they can see my presentation? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, we can, thanks, Heather. Okay. Okay, so I just want to give a brief update on um, this past year um, in what we've done in the Emergency Valley, or sorry, Alberni Valley Emergency Program and as well the Banfield Emergency Program. So as you all are aware, we had a COVID EOC that was open from March 2020 to uh, May 20 first of this year. Um, so the EOC is closed, but we're still uh, engaging with uh, the hospital and response agencies um, on COVID related matters. Uh, we meet um, with hospital staff on a, on a bi-weekly basis. Uh, we met this morning to get a, an update from Dr. Benusik. Um, and then um, there were several other uh, incidents in the Alberni Valley that we participated in throughout this year. So the Cherry Creek wildfire on Clayton Road was in June. Um, there was a large earthquake in Alaska that had the potential for a tsunami in July. Um, and then we got into the fall season with the high stream flow advisory starting in September and through October. October, November was the uh, Zim King Kingston ship with the lost cargo. And then uh, starting last week and into this week is the flood watch uh, from the atmospheric rivers. Um, so um, the next thing I would like to do is give an update on uh, training. So in June, we had uh, Cali and Limited facilitate EOC training for staff and emergency agencies. So we had five separate training sessions for each section of the EOC, so one for a operations, one for logistics, one for planning, management, and uh, finance. 
And then we had a half day exercise to test what we learned. And this was uh, using an earthquake scenario. We had 16 different agencies participate in this exercise, including uh, many ACRD and city staff who would fill roles in an EOC activation. Uh, the after action review from this exercise highlighted uh, several recommendations that we're currently implementing, including providing re reoccurring training opportunities for staff and agencies, um, updating some of our EOC processes to support an effective response. For this one particular uh, exercise in June, uh, there was 370 hours of ACRD city volunteers and emergency agencies uh, spent on this one exercise. Um, and it was this training was fully funded by a UBCM grant. In September, uh, we did a wildfire tabletop training exercise. Callian also facilitated this exercise. Uh, 15 different agencies participated. Uh, this was focused on a wildfire um, situated between the Sishot Market and Bell Road, located in the Spread Lake Fire Protection Area. Um, we re discussed roles and responsibilities of everyone, of all the participants. Um, this type of exercise worked really well um, to help build relationships, uh, to understand the capacity of other organizations, uh, learn who to call for support, um, and help solidify the role of the incident commander. And this uh, training exercise was, was fully funded by the FireSmart grant. And then most of you attended the um, elected official training on November 19th uh, via Zoom. So this session helped you all learn about your roles and responsibilities. Uh, seven members of the ACRD board attended, five members of city council attended, and Sashat Councillor Lisa Hassel and Chief Councillor Ken Watts attended from Sashat. Um, this session was also facilitated by Callian. Um, and if before and after each training session, we do um, a survey to um, understand how successful each training session was. So on the screen is some of the results from your training session a couple weeks ago. So before the training, 25% uh, of you felt that you had a poor or very poor understanding of your role in emergency, uh, with the majority of you having an average level of understanding of your role. And then after the training, 25% moved to an average understanding with 75% of you moving to a good to very good level of knowledge. Uh, so this was a significant increase in knowledge, which was great to see after this training. Um, there were a few recommendations that came out of the after action report from this session. Um, I emailed the after action report to you earlier this week. Um, there's a few things that we need to do to um, clarify uh, expenditure limits, potentially with updates to bylaws or to our policies. Um, another recommendation was to continue, to continue to provide regular training opportunities for elected officials. And I think there's some opportunity to include elected officials in future tabletop exercises with staff. Um, and then there was a specific request for spokesperson training for those that would be selected to fill that role in an emergency. And then I'm just going to touch on the FireSmart program. So in 2020, we received a large uh, provincial grant to develop a FireSmart program. Uh, we received this funding in partnership with the city, Sashat and Hupachesset. Um, this program encourages the homeowner to FireSmart their property to become more resilient to wildfire. Uh, through the funding, we were able to comp uh, complete FireSmart assessments on residential properties. Uh, we also did fire smart assessments on critical infrastructure that we own. So our fire halls, administration buildings, water infrastructure were assessed um, and recommendations have been made to make modifications to these buildings to become more resilient to wildfire. We also had a successful curbside pickup program. So uh, any homeowner that was doing uh, cleanup in their yard uh, could request uh, curbside pickup. We had a contractor go and pick up uh, from about 75 different homeowners across the valley. Uh, this program was targeted towards those with mobility issues or those without transportation to the landfill. Um, so I don't think the uh, FireSmart program has gained the attention of the community or really gained momentum at this point. Um, we just put in another FireSmart grant application for next year. We'll find out in February if we were successful. Um, but as part of this application, we applied for uh, resources, either a staff or a contractor position to really oversee the program and try and gain more traction in the community, being able to attend events and uh, deliver workshops to community members. 
Um, earlier this year, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Alberta District Fall Fair. So they have agreed to provide a temporary animal relief shelter. They've got space for up to 50 animal or 50 animals, um, and this is for hobby farms only, so not for livestock. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to the Alberni District Fall Fair for uh, stepping up and being able to offer this service to our community. Another project we've been working on this year is an app. Uh, it's called Chirp, so Canadian Hazards Emergency Response and Preparedness Mobile App. Um, so this is um, in conjunction with Dr. Ryan Reynolds from UBC. Um, you, you may re recognize his name because um, Dr. Reynolds and Alexa Tanner were here in 2018 doing some research to, to, de to determine the um, impact of the tsunami warning from January 2018. So you may have seen a report from him before he has a, a keen interest in, in tsunami and emergency preparedness. So he's working on an app um, that is for residents to prepare themselves for an emergency and to build their own preparedness and response plan. So um, it's funded by MEOPAR, which is the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network. Um, there's other partners, other communities that are involved in this app developments, including uh, the city of Nanaimo, Qualcomm, Parksville, Tofino, and Tassis. And I've just shown some screenshots here of what the app will look like. Um, some of these are from Tofino. So it, the app is specific to where you live. So you would put in your address um, and we've preloaded what hazards exist uh, where in the valley. Um, so the hazards that will show up will depend on where you're situated. And then residents would be developing an emergency plan that relates to their individual situation. So the app's going to be launched uh, shortly for the other partner communities and then later in 2020 for us. Uh, Amy Wilson's been busy gathering all of the spatial data for, for this app. Um, and then earlier this year, we were successful in receiving an EOC grant from UBCM. Uh, so this was in partnership with the city, we received $39,000 um, and that was uh, partially for the funding for training for staff in June. And then we're in the process of building a mobile kit, which is on the picture in the left. So this includes five laptops, uh, two printers and all of the EOC forms that we would need. Um, so the, the idea with the kit is to move it to a, a secondary location in the event that this EOC is unusable. Uh, we're also purchasing a satellite phone for the EOC, as shown in the picture. And we'll be making another uh, grant application for the same grant uh, coming up in February. Uh, we were also successful in receiving an ESS grant from UBCM, uh, partnered with the city on this one. We received $49,000. And that was to purchase supplies to support residents that have been evacuated from their homes. So cots, blankets, um, a generator, CCAN to house all of the supplies, iPads and printers so that our ESS volunteers can uh, register evacuees using the provincial online evacuation registration program. Um, we've been working hard on the Alberni Valley evacuation route plan. So this project started in the summer. It's also funded by UBCM. And this one is in partnership with Hupachasset, Sashaw, the city and the regional district. Uh, so we've just finished the, oops, we've just finished the uh, public engagement session. So we did five um, uh, in the city, in the Beaufort electoral area, Sprout Lake electoral area, and then the Sashaw and Hupachasset. We had an online survey where we had 400 responses. Um, and I wanna say thank you to all the directors and city council and mayor for providing input on this project. So the contractor's currently developing the plan which will be reviewed in January. We will be doing a tabletop exercise to test the plan. And then the final plan will be presented to the board of directors in February. And then I just wanted to uh, give an update on the ESS team. So as a way of reminder, ESS provides temporary support to residents who've been evacuated from their homes, providing them uh, 72 hours of accommodation, food, transportation, and any incidentals. Um, at the end of March, we ended our contract with Red Cross who had been delivering level one ESS for a number of years. So on April 1st, we took over responding to ESS calls and formed a local Alberni Valley ESS team under the leadership of Karen Freely. 
So we have 18 volunteers and they have gone under uh, 230 hours of training and they attend monthly meetings between uh, June or sorry, between September and June. We've had five activations since April and 110 hours of response time. Um, I think everyone is aware that we launched Voyant Alert, our emergency notification system in January. So as of this week, we have just over 2,500 registrants in the Alberni Valley and Banfield. So we test the system on the first Wednesday of every month at the same time as the tsunami warning siren. So you all should have received an alert uh, at 1 p.m. today. If you're not receiving the alert, uh, the alerts, please uh, reach out to Karen or myself and we'll help you ensure that you receive those in the future. We've used uh, Voyant Alert to notify uh, West Banfield residents of a boil water advisory uh, in April. Um, and we'll use the system to send critical notifications for major emergencies such as tsunami, wildfire, major flood or uh, chemical spill. There's six of us uh, that are trained to send the alerts uh, to city staff and then four regional district staff. Uh, we practice this uh, program on a monthly basis. Um, and we'll continue to promote it. And then just finally, the Banfield Emergency Program. So the Banfield Program is a volunteer-led program. Uh, we previously had a volunteer, volunteer emergency program coordinator, but he recently stepped down. So I've put out a call for new volunteers to try and recruit, recruit new volunteers and reinvigorate the program. So currently we have three new volunteers and four existing volunteers. So I'm currently working on the budget for um, 2022, which will really focus on uh, training opportunities and exercises for the volunteers, ensuring that they've got the support they needed to um, provide emergency services for their community. Um, and we will be pursuing uh, the EOC grant and ESS supplies for um, Banfield, as well as other parts of the region through the UBCM grants. And that is it. I will stop sharing and answer questions no I, I i mean i think that uh we're more prepared than we ever have been uh which when we think about that that there is probably a little scary because we know that we aren't fully prepared and uh, uh so the march towards getting there makes us realize that if we had a situation like to have in the lower mainland we would be uh, uh, really you know, a big mess and you know that possibility is out there so I uh, saw director Shannon with her hand up I think yes thank you um Heather I didn't see it in the presentation but I do have a question about um the wasp wildfire sprinkler systems I I, I had noticed that the ACRD was part of the wasp um, community associations and affiliates um, do we offer like those sprinkler kits through the office to people that want them? Um, or if you have more information on that, I mean, I know that we personally purchased one this year with it being so dry and put one on our home. Um, but we ordered right through the website. I didn't realize that we as the ACRD were affiliated and if we could have ordered through here or if we have more info on that or if we're going to be putting more out with dry summers. Yeah, I actually didn't know that we were uh, affiliated <laughs> with the program. Um, but that said, uh, the Sprout Lake Volunteer Fire Department do do sell them themselves through their fire hall. Um, okay. um, it might be something that we can look at um, in the future, but it, it's just not on the on the work plan right now to take that on. Okay, thank you. Daniel. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to give a shout out to Heather and her team. And I, I, I've worked with a lot of teams over the last 15 years in EOCs and, and whatnot. And um, I, even though I've only been here for a week and a half, uh, I have connected quite a bit with Heather. And I have to say that um, it's absolutely outstanding to see the volume of work that her and her team has produced in the last 12 months. Um, I've never seen that in, in such a short period of time. And so I, I just, I, I really want to say how incredibly impressive it is and give her a shout out publicly. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody agrees with that, I think. Ron, is that your hand up or is that uh, a glove that you lost in the air? 
Okay, so now we get to the point where we can receive these reports. Somebody? Dr. Shannon, Dr. Paulson, anything else on the report? Last one? All in favor? 